Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, and I see there's a sign saying that we're recording. That's great. Uh, yes, it's great to be here. Uh, I know many of you, uh, but um, you know, I thought that I would spend a few minutes uh, telling telling you about my uh, background and research, and then I will just uh, jump to it. Uh, you know, I'm from Argentina originally, um, and uh, I am trained as a neurologist. I did my clinical training in Argentina as a neurologist, and then I came to the U.S. to train in neurocritical care at Mass General. Uh, and in between, I took uh, some time to uh, pursue training in population genetics. Uh, my wife would say that uh, too much time. So I spent four years at the Harvard School of Public Health uh, pursuing a doctorate in genetic epidemiology. So it lies at the interface of uh, acute brain injury, neuroimaging, and population genetics. And I did my dissertation uh, at MGH and at the Bro. So my course was at Harvard Club of public, uh, public Health, but uh, most of my uh, dissertation work at MGH and the Bro, then I sort of keep uh, strong ties with Boston. Uh, and I came to Yale five years ago, and I've been super lucky to find uh, incredible mentors and partners. And I will tell you a bit about uh, sort of these partnerships uh, across campus. So uh, what I wanted to discuss with you today is um, sort of how population genetics research is being used in cerebrovascular diseases. Um, and, you know, one important uh, objective for this talk is to uh, share with you something that is very dear to my heart, which is how we are moving uh, concepts and tools and data from the research arena to the clinical arena in the form of uh, genomic medicine. And I know that this group sort of is heavily invested in this, um, in this process. But I thought that I would sort of give you a perspective from a cerebrovascular um, disease uh, point of view. I have no conflicts of interest, just to say that I'm a big fan of uh, population genetics and I try to sort of motivate everybody that I encounter to pursue this path. And these are my disclosures and funding. Um, and what I thought is, you know, I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, telling you about what we do and then uh, show it some concrete examples of the way we use uh, population genetics research uh, applied to stroke genomics. And I'm going to talk about both pathway discovery and prediction. Uh, and I'm going to spend, you know, perhaps one third of 40% of the talk sort of sharing with you in an informal way some of the initiatives that we have here at Yale uh, that bring together resources from neurology, from uh, generations, from the Department of Genetics to bring population genetics uh, to the bedside of stroke patients. Um, so just jumping into it, what we do, basically uh, my group, my lab is very interested in uh, finding um, biological mechanisms that influence all kinds of manifestations of cerebrovascular disease. And I can tell you, the, uh, our initial interest and my initial interest as a neurointensivist was related to acute brain injury. Here uh, on the upper part of the slide, you can see uh, a spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage. And by the way, let me start. So here to the left-hand side of the screen, you see uh, a pathology specimen of small vessel disease, which is one of the most important pathologies or diseases that we study in my group. And small vessel disease can lead to many things. One, as I was saying before, to the top of your screen, is uh, an intracerebral hemorrhage, a spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage that you can see here as white stuff in the middle of this um, <clears throat> light gray brain. And as you can see, as you can imagine, you know, this is a type of catastrophic brain injury. 40% of these patients die. Uh, the same uh, type of disease, small vessel disease, can lead to small vessel ischemic stroke. So the type of stroke that happens when a brain vessel is occluded. Uh, and I gotta tell you, more and more we are interested not only in the acute manifestations of cerebrovascular disease, but also in the uh, non-clinical or subacute manifestations of cerebrovascular disease. And a good example is here to your right-hand side, you can see an MRI <clears throat> that is showing a bunch of uh, white dots, and this is what we call white matter hyperintensities. 
many people who have white matter hyperintensities do not have clinical manifestations, but we know that this particular radiological phenotype is strongly associated with uh, many things that are bad, cognitive decline, um, gait impairment, late life depression. So our research is changing to not only encompass uh, acute manifestations of cerebrovascular disease in the form of brain bleeds and ischemic stroke, but also to try to understand how um, genetic variation, and we work with both rare and common genetic variation, influence silent manifestations of um, cerebrovascular disease and how these genetic variants influence more subtle uh, clinical manifestations that are not catastrophic, but have an important influence in um, you know, a person's life, including disability, gait impairment, and cognitive decline and dementia. Um, <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure that everybody here is familiar with this slide. This is one of the major causes of death uh, for males and females in the US, uh, and this is um, true across the board in many, in many countries. Uh, and more and more, the way we're thinking about it, and it's related to the prior slide, what I was showing, what we are interested in, <clears throat> um, we realize that when we talk about cardiovascular disease and within cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, we are only looking at the tip of the iceberg. So the prior slide, let me go back, pertains to clinically evident cardiovascular disease that comes in the form of coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, stroke, and dementia. But this is only the tip of the iceberg, and more and more we realize that there is a bunch of uh, subacute or clinically subtle or even clinically silent um, manifestations of cardiovascular disease that come in the form of cognitive decline, perhaps not uh, jeopardizing everyday activities, but still changing the functionality of a person, uh, and also frailty and disability. So perhaps a person has not sustained a stroke, but you can see that the functional status is declining <clears throat> in a very subtle way that it's only perceived by their family members. So what we do in my lab is to um, basically combine tools, data, um, <clears throat> and uh, technologies that we use in population genetics. We combine these uh, resources with neuroimaging analysis. And you know we are very invested in open access and big, and big data. And as many groups across campus, we try to identify novel pathophysiological mechanisms, find novel drug targets, and use population genetics data to predict uh, disease and restratified patients. <clears throat> and as you can see at the top of the slide, uh, more and more, you know, we are very interested, and that has become our mission statement, to bring population genetics to the bedside, to transform our research into clinically meaningful tools. And I got to tell you, for me, it has been a great journey. I uh, started my dissertation in 2011. And my dissertation was about the utilization of polygenic risk scores and genome-wide association studies in cerebrovascular disease. And I got to tell you, a decade ago, when I would show up at clinical meetings and say, well, you know, we're doing all this polygenic risk score analysis because one day we're going to use these tools at the bedside so that people would frown and, you know, my, my supervisors would sort of uh, laugh in a, in a loving way. Uh, but still we're a bit uh, skeptical. And I think that more and more, even though there are significant challenges and significant questions to be answered, we are now in the process of actually trying these things. And then by trying these things, we will be able to recognize the limitations and also tackle the limitations. Uh, many of the problems related to bringing some population genetics research tools to the bed science pertain to theoretical um, theoretical points that are tough to discuss in the vacuum. So I'm a big proponent of just doing this, of course, making sure that we are you know, very strict from an ethical uh, and reproducibility perspective, but to do it so that we can identify the barriers along the way. <clears throat> uh, one uh, good example of what we do in terms of using population genetics to um, acquire more biological knowledge in cerebrovascular diseases pertains 
to um, trying to understand the role of lipid levels and in hemorrhagic stroke. And I'm sorry, um, you know, the PowerPoint is, uh, has a mind on his own, of her own or his own. Um, and this is a work that has been led by Elena Kirsch uh, in, my, in my group. Uh, and basically the motivation for uh, this research is that we know that elevated LDL is bad in general. However, there are some exceptions. And one of the exceptions pertains to how LDL levels and lipid levels influence the risk of uh, brain bleeds, of hemorrhagic strokes, like the CAT scan that I was showing at the beginning of, of the presentation. And there is strong evidence that is coming from observational studies and randomized clinical trials showing that as uh, the overall LDL levels go up, the risk of having uh, an, uh, an intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, hemorrhagic stroke goes down. And this is, uh, you know, I, I, uh, just to confirm that you heard correctly, it's uh, in contrast to what happens with most cardiovascular disease in general as you the risk of having cardiovascular events goes up. And there is good evidence that this is not the case for brain bleeds or intracerebral hemorrhage. Actually, there is good evidence from observational studies and randomized clinical trials that uh, the risk of these brain bleeds could go up. And ICH in this slide stands for intracerebral hemorrhage, which is one of two uh, very frequent types of spontaneous brain bleeds. So what we did is we uh, used population genetics to investigate whether the cumulative burden of genetic variants known to influence lipid levels also influences the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, and we uh, investigated whether these particular associations were mediated by particular fractions, because of course, uh, one important question is whether lipid levels are associated with risk of X, but one important additional question is to um, uh, identify which is the mediating lipid fraction. In clinical practice, we usually look at total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. So it's important to pinpoint which one is the mediating fraction. And then we used Medina randomization analysis to try to uh, estimate causal effects of these genetically instrumented lipid levels on the risk of intracellular hemorrhage. So what we did <clears throat> is we uh, combined data from uh, two different resources, the UK Biobank to identify the best instruments, the best loss related to lipid levels. And then we combined data from three independent genetic studies of intracerebral hemorrhage. And we used those uh, studies to uh, estimate the effect of these lipid related instruments on risk of ICH. So formally in stage one, we identify lipid related loci with a p-value of uh, less than five times 10 to the minus eight. It's not uh, one, is five, so genome-wide significance. We constructed lipid fraction specific polygenic risk scores, and we test for association between these polygenic risk, for risk scores and lipid fractions in the UKB. In uh, stage two, we uh, evaluated the association or tested for association between this, this uh, same lipid-related polygenic risk scores and risk of ICH using four case control uh, genetic studies of ICH. In the end, it was three, so there's a typo there. Um, and uh, in stage three, we combined these two effect estimates, polygenic risk score of lipids against lipids and polygenic risk score of lipids against ICH to generate causal estimates for the uh, association between genetically instrumented lipid levels and risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, and these are the uh, descriptive characteristics of uh, all the data that we used. As I was saying before, we used uh, the UK Biobank to estimate the effect of this lipid-related polygenic risk score on lipids. It sounds like an obvious analysis, but it's important for um, mandela randomization analysis. And basically, uh, in this analysis, we evaluated the data on 315,000 people. And then we combine data from these three case control studies of intracellular hemorrhage, the GOTCHA study, which is a multi-center study in the US, uh, 
the uh, multi-center ICH study from the International Stroke Genomics Consortium and the GERF study, which is a famous study in neurology and observational study focused on uh, ICH and intracellular hemorrhage that also has GWAS data. So we uh, use the UK Biobank data to estimate the effect of the PRS on lipids. And these three case control studies of intracellular hemorrhage to estimate the effect of this lipid-related PRS on ICH. Uh, this is just to show that, as expected, and of course this would come as no surprise to this audience, these polygenic risk scores built with, um, with um, common genetic risk variants, independent common genetic risk variants for each of the lipid fractions, roughly between 350 and 400 variants for each fraction, is significantly associated with its corresponding lipid fraction in the UK Biobank. And you can see here the variance explained that varies between 9% for total cholesterol to 5% for triglycerides. Here, primary analysis was in the entire population and secondary analysis was, um, sorry, the primary analysis was in Europeans and the secondary analysis was on everybody. And of course, the p-value for this um, sort of obvious analysis is very, very small. Uh, on the uh, second stage, and it risk scores on uh, risk of intracellular hemorrhage on these three case control study of ICH. And I will bring your attention to the bottom row, the last row of this table, where you have the meta-analysis across these three studies for uh, total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. And again, what we're showing here is the results of a lipid-based polygenic risk score against risk of spontaneous intracellular hemorrhage. And as you can see here, the results were significant for uh, total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, and they were not significant for HDL and triglycerides, although I recognize that it was borderline significant for um, HDL uh, this p-value probably uh, would not surpass Bonferroni correction. Uh, so the main takeaway of this particular part of the analysis is that each additional standard deviation of a polygenic risk score built with lipid-related variants was associated, and this is the most important result, with a 12% decrease in the risk of uh, intracellular hemorrhage. And, um, I would say, in addition to, of course, the significance of the association, one important uh, takeaway, uh, take home message is that the direction of the effect, as I was explaining at the beginning, is the opposite as you would expect for all other cardiovascular outcomes. As the number of genetic risk loci for uh, LDL levels goes up, the risk of having an intracellular hemorrhage goes down confirm them from a population genetics perspective what uh, others have seen in observational and observational studies and clinical trials. And this is the combination of the prior estimates in Mendelian randomization analysis. Uh, it's great, you know, to this audience, I don't have to sort of sell the causal inference properties of this analysis. We all recognize that there are significant limitations when using Mendelian randomization, but if the assumptions hold, there are significant, there are important conclusions that we can obtain from this kind of analysis. So when combining the effect uh, estimates from the prior two steps, we um, come up with Mendelian randomization analysis or Mendelian randomization estimates for the effect of genetically determined total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol on the risk of intracellular hemorrhage. Uh, and as you can see here, we implemented different methods, the ratio method, the inverse variance weighted method, the weighted median. And there are consistent results for uh, all these methods, especially for LDL cholesterol. And you know, the way to interpret this is that for every additional micromole of genetically instrumented LDL cholesterol level, there was roughly a 35% decrease in the risk of intracellular hemorrhage. And again, I want to call your attention to the inverse association, the inverse uh, direction of the association between uh, genetically determined lipid levels and risk 
of intracellular hemorrhage. And the last row, it's the MR agar intercept, which is a measure of horizontal pleiotropy. And again, I never know, you know, when, uh, when presenting these results to a genetics audience, perhaps we should not even be saying these things. Perhaps this is obvious for all of you or most of you, but, you know, these p-values should be non-significant, just uh, confirming that there is no horizontal pleiotropy uh, in uh, this analysis. And then we went ahead and we wanted to test these same hypotheses in the other type of hemorrhagic stroke, which is subarachnoid hemorrhage, and particularly aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. This type of stroke is well known to the population, is the type of stroke that happens when a brain aneurysm bursts and a bunch of blood is spilled into the subarachnoid space. And, you know, um, Murat Bunel has done amazing work on, uh, on this front related to, um, to population genetics aspects of uh, this disease. So we're building on his work and it's great to have his support. Uh, so we went ahead and conducted a very similar analysis using a two sample Mendela randomization design, uh, selecting as instrument independent um, genetic variants that are known to associate with circulated LDL cholesterol. Um, we found a total of 117 SNPs. We uh, implemented the primary analysis in Europeans plus Asians. And uh, also in this you know, first analysis, we used the composite of aneurysm presence and aneurysm rupture causing a sovereign hemorrhage just to improve power. Looked at Europeans only and um, people who bled only, meaning people that had an aneurysm of sovereign hemorrhage. And I didn't want to spend a bunch of time uh, on the methods, but I did want to show these results that are uh, very uh, exciting. And this is work led by Julian Acosta at Pozog in my lab. Perhaps I said that already. Uh, and the results are consistent with what we uh, found when looking at intracerebral hemorrhage. And again, spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage, which is blood uh, in the brain parenchyma, and subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is blood in the subarachnoid space are the most important types of uh, brain bleeds, and they share a bunch of their pathophysiology. Um, there are joint heritability estimates that call for 50 to 60% uh, genetic correlation between these two traits. Uh, and here you can see uh, very consistent results uh, when evaluating genetically determined lipid levels. Um, as the genetically instrumented lipid levels goes up, the risk of having a sore and a hemorrhage goes down. And this is uh, you know, very robust to very different types of analysis using the inverse variance weighted method, uh, restricting the analysis to Europeans only, uh, and using, using uh, other types of analysis like MR Eger, MR Preso. And um, when using an LDL specific instrument, removing any SNPs that might be associated with other things, for example, blood pressure. So uh, in conclusion, what we found using population genetics tools is that there is significant evidence showing that for brain bleeds, for uh, hemorrhagic stroke, the relationship between lipid levels and the risk of these outcomes is the opposite as what we know in general. As the uh, amount of lipid levels goes up, the risk of having a hemorrhagic stroke goes down, or inversely, uh, when the uh, level of lipids goes down, the risk of having a hemorrhagic stroke goes up. And this is very significant because, of course, we as clinicians, we tend to uh, decrease um, lipid levels, especially in middle aged adults and older adults, as much as we can. Just wanted to conclude this part of the talk uh, with um, a very nice result that was published last year in Annals of Neurology, just to make the point that this idea that we need to be careful in terms of uh, lipid reduction is not only for brain bleeds. I would like to uh, bring your attention to this particular part. I'm not sure if you can see my uh, arrow, probably you cannot. But these are results of uh, genetically determined uh, lipid levels and LDL in uh, different traits related to cognitive decline and dementia. And when you look at the third analysis from the top down, PCSK9 inhibition, 
uh, and these are all Mendelian randomization analysis. This uh, group from the UK, which is very well known, and they publish extensively in MR uh, studies, they found that as the amount of lipid levels goes down using PCSK9 inhibitors, the risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease goes up. And again, of course, this comes with a bunch of caveats and, you know, it should not be sort of presented uh, the same as our analysis in a hand wavy way, right? These are just observations from, um, from a population genetic perspective. But, you know, learning from other things that we've seen in the past, it merits keeping an eye on these things. Uh, and I would say that the main implication is not so much that we need to be concerned about lowering lipids, which we really like as clinicians. I'm a strong neurologist, uh, and I really like to bring lipids uh, down. But it really points to a very interesting pathophysiological mechanism that can be uh, perturbed or modulated to uh, prevent and treat this condition. Um, and of course, you know, the big question is, you know, if this is true, then why does this happen? And there are many hypotheses, and I've been discussing with, um, you know, several people across campus to uh, sort of deploy animal models to look into this question. But there are basically two possible explanations that have been put forward. One is that as lipid levels go down, the blood-brain barrier integrity um, sort of suffers because the lipid membrane becomes uh, unstable, especially uh, in vessels, and these uh, can cause um, smooth uh, muscle necrosis. So that makes sense from an intuitive perspective. There is some um, uh, uh, results and data from animal models, but of course, you know, there is no direct evidence in humans. And then the other one that I sort of uh, really like, because I think that it makes sense, is the two hits hypothesis, which basically states that um, it's not only the lipid lowering that causes this increase in the risk of hemorrhagic stroke, but that there is probably a combination of factors. And, you know, it would be very interesting to find the other factor, uh, but, you know, possible options are blood thinners, hypertension, and inflammation um, in the setting of autoimmune diseases or infection. So this is something that we're thinking very hard from a modeling perspective, because it was very interesting to uh, understand better why some people bleed, some people have brain bleeds when lipid levels, especially LDL, uh, goes down. Um, and I got to tell you, the, the, this topic has received significant attention to the point that the NINDS has funded the Saturn clinical trial, which is you know, a huge study, 140 sites across the US and Canada, that will enroll 1,500 survi survivors of intracerebral hemorrhage. And the idea is to test the hypothesis that not going back to statins, all these are patients that have an indication for statins, uh, the hypothesis that not going back to statins will be uh, non-inferior to um, going back to statins. So basically the hypothesis of the trial or the goal of this trial is to confirm that from a clinical perspective, it makes sense to not put these patients back on statins because a significant lowering in lipid levels will increase the risk of having a second brain break. Um, so that's the way we use population genetics tools to learn more about the biology of the phenotypes that we care about. Uh, this uh, third part of the talk was to show you how we think about uh, using these tools for risk prediction. And this is work done by Julian Acosta in my group. Uh, I will try to sort of move quickly through this part because I really want to get to what we're doing in terms of bringing, um, you know, these tools to the bedside. Uh, with, uh, you know, we worked hard to find the question that was amenable, particularly amenable to uh, risk stratification and prediction from a genomics perspective. And so the, what we realized is that the best target population was going to be a population that is relatively healthy, so that genetics can play a major role. And we selected an upper threshold of 60 years of age. We wanted to avoid very healthy, very young uh, people that have a very low baseline risk 
of um, having a cardiovascular event. And again, I just want to emphasize that you know this um, prediction project is based on cardiovascular disease, broadly speaking. My group is focused on cerebrovascular disease, but you know we also work on cardiovascular disease broadly. On from a power perspective, it made sense in this case to consider cardiovascular disease broadly defined, so coronary artery disease and stroke. Um, and when finding this ideal population for um, using genetics for prediction, we also realized that it was so that it made sense to focus on people who did not have clinically evident cardiovascular risk factors, because we know when, when these are present, you know, clinical data usually has a better um, prediction performance as opposed to genetic data. Uh, and we really wanted to account for sex because we know that sex is an important risk factor and effect modifier in off cardiovascular disease. And as I was explaining before, when trying to find this ideal population for a prediction project using uh, genomic data, um, we thought that it made sense from a power perspective to combine uh, coronary artery disease and stroke. So the conclusion is uh, we um, looked at acute vascular events in middle-aged uh, adults with no vascular risk factors. And I just want to emphasize once more that even though we are uh, interested in cardiovascular disease, the main project, the main goal of this project was to find like the ideal population to deploy prediction tools based on genomics. Uh, so the study aims were to estimate the cumulative risk of acute vascular events, stroke, and myocardial infarction in middle-aged persons range of 40 to 60, estimate sex-specific cumulative risks of acute vascular events uh, in this population, determine whether genetic susceptibility to cardiovascular disease influences the risk of uh, acute vascular events, and then um, see if this genetic susceptibility was modified by uh, sex. And we pursued this project in the UK Biobank. We evaluated roughly 300,000 people. Uh, within this population, uh, there were roughly 4,000 acute vascular events. And just want to emphasize again, these 300,000 people are middle-aged adults, 40 to 60, no uh, cardiovascular disease we still found roughly uh, 4,000 events. Uh, and we created a polygenic risk score using um, known genetic loci for uh, these uh, two uh, phenotypes, coronary artery disease and myocardial infarction and stroke. Uh, and we used a polygenic risk score built with these variants to categorize the population of interest into high genetic risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. Uh, these are the numbers here on the left-hand side. You have the cumulative number of events for everybody and then for low, intermediate, and high genetic risk. And as you can see, the number of events from a crude and adjusted perspective uh, really goes up uh, as the genetic risk goes up. And this idea is uh, more better represented in the figure to your right, where you can see the survival curves for uh, time to event, and the event is a composite of uh, a Myers stroke. For low genetic risk is the red curve, intermediate genetic risk, the green curve, and high genetic risk, the uh, blue curve. Um, and um, these were the um, results, the crude results, when not when looking at genetics, but looking at gender. And you can see that gender is another important risk factor. You can see that uh, the turquoise line applies to males. The red line represents females. The black line is everybody. And the same as the prior slide, uh, sex, it's a very important determinant of uh, cardiovascular disease in addition to genetic susceptibility. But this is the most important part of the analysis and the reason why we think that this would be a great application for population genetics um, and risk prediction. So this is what happens when you um, pursue interaction analysis and you consider both genetic susceptibility represented by a polygenic risk score and sex 
Um, so here in these bars, you have to your left-hand side females, and then to your right-hand side males, and then the colors represent low genetic risk, intermediate genetic risk, and high genetic risk. And you can see that if you compare females with low genetic risk to males with high genetic risk, there is a significant increase in the absolute risk of having a, a cardiovascular event. And just to say one more time, these are middle-aged adults, no clinically evident cardiovascular disease. So if you thought about prediction models, there is nothing competing with the genes here. There are no clinical variables except for uh, age and sex. Um, and this is the uh, same results when implementing um, multivariable analysis using uh, Cox regression models. Basically, the results are very similar, but perhaps in a from a visual perspective, you can see more clearly that compared to females that have low genetic risk, males that have high genetic risk have 4.5 times the risk of having a uh, cardiovascular. So the conclusions, uh, you know, for this um, this particular analysis is that the risk of acute vascular events increases rapidly in middle-aged persons, uh, both male sex and high genetic risk. And here, genetic risk is polygenic risk conferred by multiple independent loci that are known to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. This genetic risk is uh, significantly associated with acute vascular events in middle-aged persons. Uh, and you know, the most important result in my, in my view is the significant interaction between these two independent risk factors. When you combine these two, you can identify middle-aged males with high genetic risk as being at particular high risk You know, this is a nice application for prediction is that by definition, this population does not have vascular risk factors or clinically evident cardiovascular disease. So uh, any prediction ability will come via age, sex, and genes. So um, that's what we do. Those are uh, two or three examples of how we use population genetics tools to learn more about the biology of cerebrovascular disease, uh, about the biology of cardiovascular disease, um, and, um, and how we use this information to build prediction models to identify people who are at high risk. Um, but I really wanted to spend time sharing with you what we're doing to bring these things to the bedside. And again, this is something that has been very dear to my heart for a long time. And it's great that this is happening and that here at Yale, we have the right resources, the right people, the right tools, uh, and the support to do it. So how are we doing this? Um, what, one important piece of information is that all the work that we're doing to bring um, population genetics to the bedside is done within what is called the Buer Foundation Network. This is funding that comes through the American Heart Association. It's a three-center network, Yale, MGH, and UCSF. And these uh, American Heart Association viewer centers for hemorrhagic stroke research were, um, were started with a very generous 11 million gift from the Buer Foundation. And the idea is that we will tackle uh, tough things related to hemorrhagic stroke research. One of the things that we are tackling is how to bring um, population genetics to the bedside. And I just wanted to emphasize with this slide that this is a, you know, a huge effort that involves many people across campus. Lauren Sansing, who is the section chief for stroke here to your left-hand side, is one of the center PIs. Kevin Sheff, who is the section chief for neurocritical care, is the other center PI. I'm one of the PIs, of the project PIs that involves um, population genetics, but it's great to uh, pursue this particular project with this uh, significant infrastructure. And when thinking about our project for the viewer networks, uh, for the viewer network, we wanted to find something that was very clinically relevant. By design, we wanted to identify a question that was going to be exciting from a clinical perspective. 
This is uh, what we do in the neuro ICU. This is a scan for a 66-year-old female with a, his, with a uh, history of hypertension that um, had a left frontal IPH, this white stuff here. When you look at the figure to your left-hand side, the white stuff is the blood. We uh, implemented what is called the MISTI procedure, which means that we place a catheter and we aspirate the blood. And here to your right-hand side, you can see the CAT scan and the MRI for this patient after the procedure, the blood has gone away and she significantly improved. So we wanted to think about these clinical scenarios when thinking about the project that we wanted to bring to these viewer networks of uh, hemorrhagic stroke research. And one thing that is present throughout these cases, one thing that becomes very important before the event, during the event, in the subacute stage when the patient is admitted to the neuro ICU, in the post-stroke uh, time during the recovery phase, and that it's crucial for the long-term follow-up, is blood pressure and hypertension. Um, and because blood pressure and hypertension is so highly heritable, roughly 30 to 40% of blood pressure can be explained by genetic variation, we thought that it was going to be very intuitive for clinicians <clears throat> to focus our genomic medicine project on hypertension and genetically defined hypertension. Um, so the overall hypothesis of this project that we're pursuing here at the DL, but again, it's sort of embedded in the um, Yale viewer center, in the, um, sorry, the American Heart Association viewer uh, network for hemorrhagic stroke research. The main hypothesis is that polygenic susceptibility to hypertension influences the clinical trajectory of people who survive a brain bleed people who survive a hemorrhagic stroke. And the main goal is to evaluate clinical applications of genomic data uh, at the bedside of uh, survivors of uh, you know, a large collaboration that involves uh, people from Yale. I've been working now for two years with Hong Yu Zhao and Mike Murray in different projects. And this is one funded project. Uh, John Rosen from MGH and the Bro, who is my former uh, mentor and now is a dear friend, colleague, uh, and partner. Dan Wu, who is also you know, a very close mentor, friend, and colleague from the University of Cincinnati, and Ashkan Schwamanesh from my master. Um, and basically, the first step was to confirm that polygenic susceptibility to hypertension indeed plays uh, or has an important role in blood pressure trajectories in stroke survivors. So this is a very quick slide just to make that point. These are results for a polygenic risk score built with uh, known uh, loci that uh, increase blood pressure. And we evaluated whether this polygenic risk score uh, was uh, important in roughly 44,500 uh, survivors of ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. To your left-hand side, you can see uh, observed systolic blood pressure across quintiles of polygenic risk. On the, in the middle, you can see the prevalence of uncontrolled blood pressure, so people that have systolic more than 140, no matter what, across quintiles of this polygenic risk score. And then to your right-hand side, you have resistant hypertension, so this is blood pressure below, uh, above 140 when uh, on three different medications. And you can see that when you look at observed blood pressure, uncontrolled blood pressure, and resistant blood pressure, for all these phenotypes, the, um, the risk for uncontrolled blood pressure and resistant blood pressure and the observed blood pressure for systolic really goes up as the polygenic susceptibility to hypertension goes up. So that was sort of the first part of the project was to say, well, you know, we have enough data to pursue this at the bedside. So the first concrete application leverages clinical trials. Our idea is that if we can embed polygenic uh, risk or analysis and population genetic tools into clinical trials, and we can show that genetic data changes the primary question of a trial, then we're going to be very close to clinical implementation because by design, 
these clinical trials are intended to change clinical, uh, clinical practice. So what we did is we brought population genetics to the um, <clears throat> to a question that it's um, you know very heavily debated in the field of stroke um, currently, and this question is whether people that have a brain bleed and have a history of atrial fibrillation should go back to being anticoagulated. I realize that it's a very technical. Um, clinical scenario, but it's a very intuitive one. So these are patients that have atrial fibrillation. They wear an anticoagulation for the atrial fibrillation. They have a brain bleed. And the question is whether these patients should go back to being anticoagulated. As you can imagine, you know, there are strong arguments both ways. On the one hand, we know that these patients have a super high risk of uh, an ischemic stroke if they are not anticoagulated. On the flip side, imagine um, sort of restarted blood thinners in a patient that had a brain bleed, which is a catastrophic event that can be deadly in 30% of the cases. So our hypothesis is that genetic risk factors can change this very subtle risk-benefit ratio between accepting the risk of an ischemic stroke and holding anticoagulation or accepting the risk of having another brain bleed and restarting anticoagulation. So we are uh, using, uh, we are collecting DNA samples of two clinical trials that are answering this question right now. One is the ASPIRE trial in the United States and the other one is the ENRICH AF trial in Canada. They have a combined sample size of 2000 uh, survivors of uh, hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, and again, they are trying to answer this particular question. They have the same design. They are randomizing patients to going back to anticoagulation or not after having a brain bleed. And the idea is to genotype all the DNA of all these patients at the Yale Center for Genomic Analysis using the Global Diversity Array, uh, and then estimate the polygenic risk for hypertension based on those genetic risk factors. And again, the idea, going back to the prior slide, is that these genetic risk factors for hypertension may change this very subtle balance between accepting the risk of thrombosis or accepting the risk of having a brain bleed. And to finalize, the uh, last project, <clears throat> which we are all very excited about, uh, leverages the Generations project, which you know I know this audience is uh, very familiar with Generations. You know, I have been a big fan and I've been in touch with, uh, with Mike Murray, um, you know, for two or three years now. And the idea is to leverage this unique resource that you all know very well to return this information to patients. So the idea is that, let me see. Um, yeah, so these are the details. The idea is to... Um, enroll 500 stroke survivors in generations, calculate the polygenic risk score, a polygenic risk score that represents the polygenic susceptibility to hypertension using 600 well-described independent genetic risk variants for elevated blood pressure, and then use all of us that will hopefully release genomic data uh, in the winter to calculate the distribution of uh, this blood pressure related polygenic risk score accounting for the ancestry. There are significant concerns that these polygenic risk scores may behave differently according to race ethnicity. So we're going to use all of us to estimate the distribution of this particular blood pressure related polygenic risk score, and then use this distribution to assign polygenic risk for hypertension as low, intermediate or high to these 500 stroke survivors in generations. Uh, and the idea is that we're going to return this information to both treating clinicians and patients. And again, what we want is to start very small. The only information that we're going to return is whether <clears throat> the patient, these are patients that survive a stroke, have a high intermediate 
or low genetic susceptibility to hypertension. And um, we're not going to focus that much on the clinical implications because we have already established those in the analysis that I showed you a few slides back. We're going to focus on the interpretability. So do you understand what this means? And then the willingness to act on this information in the uh, simplest example, uh, you know, we would like to know whether clinicians are willing to monitor closely, perhaps using wearables or other kinds of continuous monitoring when they have the genetic information. And on the patient side, we're interested in whether these patients would be uh, willing to try very simple things like exercise or diet. Um, so that's the overall idea. We have enrolled 60 patients so far and the project has been going for a year. So we are you know, on schedule um, and it's been a great way to uh, bring different resources from across campus, including, as I said, my uh, collaborations with Michael Murray and Hang Yu Zhao, amongst many, many others. So in summary, uh, and again, thank you so much for the invitation. It's great to you know, share all these results and all these ideas with all of you. Um, just to, to summarize, uh, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease you know, poses a huge challenge, uh, and it's sort of increasingly recognized that what we see clinically is just the tip of the iceberg. Most likely, uh, there are a bunch of people who have very subtle manifestations that are still not being fully captured. Um, I'm hoping that uh, I could explain some of the concrete examples that we have in terms of using population genetics for cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular disease. Uh, and I presented one example of causal inference and new biological target, uh, targets related to lipid levels in intracellular hemorrhage and one concrete example of risk prediction. And then the most important piece is how to bring all these tools to uh, clinical practice. Uh, and I spoke about the Yale uh, AHA Viewer Center Network uh, and the, uh, one of the goals of the Yale Viewer Center is to um, study how bringing these population genetic tools would work in our stroke patients. And we have two specific projects. One pertains to blood pressure genomics in stroke survivors who also have atrial fibrillation. And the question is whether they should be anticoagulated. Our hypothesis is related to blood pressure may modify this very subtle balance in um, these stroke survivors. And then the second project via generations is to go ahead and return information on polygenic risk scores based on blood pressure to both uh, clinicians and patients. Uh, and with that, I would like to you know, thank a bunch of people. Um, you know, I feel very lucky to have been recruited to Yale uh, of course, you know, thanks to my lab, uh, I have a bunch of collaborators across campus. Uh, I have not spoken about uh, our work in aging research, but one of our uh, main um, collaborators and partners has been Thomas Gill at the Yale Pepper Center for Aging, and we have an entire line of uh, risk prediction projects uh, applied to older adults. Uh, Hong Yu Zhao, who has been a great partner, uh, Murat, who sort of has been great from the beginning, and we're building on his amazing work on SAA genomics. Um, Ara Hall, um, and um, am I forgetting somebody? And then, you know, the others are not sort of linked to the genetics community, but are, you know, close partners in the stroke and neuro ICU groups. Uh, and then, of course, uh, our funding sources. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And thanks again for the invitation. Thank you so much, Guido. Um, you can open up the floor for questions. We have about five minutes. I have a question. Oh, it's Miriam DeMeo. Are you going to be able to uh, stratify people by ancestry in terms of risk estimates? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. As you can imagine, we've been thinking very hard about um, you know this um, about this question about this problem, quote unquote. Um, 
And the idea is, yes, <clears throat> I would say we have to, and we've been thinking very hard to uh, find the right population to learn about how the distribution of these polygenic risk scores will change across different ancestry groups. Our plan is to use uh, all of us, assuming that the genetic data will be released uh, in the winter, uh, but we are open to other ideas. Uh, I would say the answer is yes, we're thinking about it and we recognize that we learn about sort of um, differences across ancestry groups in terms of how these polygenic risk scores behave. Uh, but we're you know, certainly open to ideas. Very, very interesting, uh, uh, enlightening talk. And I was so curious, um, you can elaborate a little bit more when you um, calculate a polygenic score, what kind of criteria you actually overall kind of selecting the uh, sort of independent variant, what, what kind of general criteria you, 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 you use? And the second question is, I guess, um, eventually uh, for the bad side, how do you see envisioning how the polygenic score eventually we're going to use it in the clinical um, um, to guiding the clinical care management? Do you have any sort of a vision or right now based on what's a stroke? I think it's a very, very good example to begin with for this uh, direction. So. Yes, uh, thank you for these questions. Um, you know, in terms of selecting the variants, um, I didn't want to bore you guys. There are so many different strategies. We think that at least at the beginning, we're going to use a very simple one. We're going to uh, select independent with R square less than, you know, 0.1, or we can even be more stringent 0.01. Uh, independent variants that are known to be genome-wide significantly associated with blood pressure, so with p-values of five times 10, less than five times 10 to the minus eight. Um, and we are thinking that it makes sense to focus on, you know, low frequency and common variants. So, you know, 1% and above. That's sort of the initial plan, you know, to have this very use, very simple set of criteria, independent, genome-wide significant, low frequency and common. Now we recognize that there are so many other tools, and it is something that I've been discussing with Hong Yu. You know, there are polygenic risk scores that use all genetic variants across the genome. There are uh, polygenic risk score strategies that um, sort of use annotation. And so definitely we'll consider those, but our idea is to be very simple just uh, thinking that we need to communicate these things to a clinical audience. And in terms of how to use this at the bedside, <clears throat> you know, the, um, the signal, I think, you know, a good first step will be to show that the genetic predisposition modifies interventions that are being tested in clinical trials. Uh, there is a good body of literature showing that when you use this data, the effect of a given intervention, for example, PCSK9 inhibitors or statins, it really changes. So people with high genetic risk obtain significantly higher benefit. So I think that that's a nice way to start because we don't have to prove that this works. We just need to prove that it modifies something that works. Does that make sense? Thanks, yeah. Okay, so it looks like we're up on our time. If anyone has any additional questions, you can always email me and I can connect you with Dr. Falson. And um, thank you so much. This is a fantastic presentation. Um, and this is being recorded as well. So if um, anybody wants access to the recording, please reach out to me. And then last um, but not least, please don't forget to text the number that has been listed in the chat. Um, to receive CME credit. Thank you guys. Thanks Thank again. you so much.